So it's a uh, fairly sunny, bright Sunday afternoon and I've been doing a little bit of clearing up around the old cabin that my wife and I used to live in. We lived here seven years with our four children as they were growing up through fairly impressionable years, through their teenage years. Six of us lived in there. It was pretty good. Uh, the boys used to sleep in a caravan and uh, we lived there, ate there, worked there, slept there. <laughs> For the most part uh, during that time it was great it was interesting it was a time when kids were developing and asking questions and they had a chance to grow up living out here in this really really natural environment in touch with everything that was happening with the weather and the seasons and the animals in the fields behind that hedge it's all greened up but as you can see probably there are uh, just still a number of sheep kicking around the place in the fields throwing up all sorts of questions and uh, having to get answers to the serious questions of their little lives. It's good to be out here now this afternoon tidying this up a little bit and remembering those times, remembering the sorts of questions they used to raise and how we used to have to struggle sometimes, I used to have to struggle sometimes, to answer them. Well, this is the inside of the cabin. It's, uh, it's all gutted out now. It's not occupied. Uh, it has to be left empty because... Uh, of legal constraints and so on so it's just empty but it, it's sometimes nice to just come in and have a sit in here and have a look around again and uh, remember those those times uh, when children ask the hardest questions that's on my mind today what do we do what do we make of it um, how do we handle it when we as maybe as children of God ask hard questions have hard questions thrown up by the condition and circumstances of our lives and it appears that God doesn't seem to be answering those questions how do we handle that? What do we make of it? Well, you don't always answer the questions that a child asks, do you, in a straight manner, because that may not be the best thing to do. There may be times when we say to a child, peace child, you really wouldn't understand. There may be times when we say to a child, peace child, you really don't need to know that yet. There may be times when we say to a child, Peace child, you can't handle the truth. Now you might want to say, some of those answers are inadequate. They're not satisfying. They don't deal with the problem that I've got. You simply don't understand the scale of my difficulty. Well, how did our children come to find such answers acceptable from us, at least for the time being. Those answers very often become acceptable to the child because simply they know they're loved. They've asked a hard question. The answer, for one reason or another, it's not appropriate to be given to them yet, at this time. But they've come for what in Wales we call a little kutch, um, a hug, uh, an expression of love and care. And knowing that they're loved by the person who hasn't given them the answer sets the whole thing in a workable context. There was an occasion I'll never forget when I was trying to do something for a child that was trying to be independent in teenage years. And the child turned to me and said, Dad, look, we know you love us. We know that you'd give us the shirt off your back. But what if the person who couldn't give us an answer to the question would give us not only the shirt off his back, but the lifeblood from his veins? because of his love for us. Doesn't that set the whole I don't know the answer yet in a very different context? As a working pastor, I sometimes find that people ask very difficult questions because something else is going on. Maybe the question they're raising is not the real question, but the question is how do I live with the implications of a God who loves me in spite of everything I'm having to go through? Or maybe that person is actually wrestling with a very real depression of one sort and another. And it's colouring their whole outlook on life and their whole ability to trust or not ability to trust God with answers that we don't have yet. There's a man in the Old Testament in the Bible who's a very, very rich man. He has, according to the measure of his own life and times, everything going for him. The man's name is Job. And Job, in the course of time, loses everything that he's ever had. 
Not because he's a bad man, not because he's done something wrong, not because he's upset God in any particular way, but he just does. And even his wife, at one point, sees his life has come so low that she counsels him, Job, as you sit there on the rubbish heap outside the town, scraping the sores on your body with a piece of broken pottery for relief, having lost children, donkeys, livestock, land, homes, why don't you just curse God and die? Even his own wife said that to him. And along came a succession of friends, one after the other, with one unsatisfactory conclusion of the matter for him to answer his question head on. None of it would do. The answers were not adequate. And sometimes when we have hard questions that we wish to have God answer for us, oh, sometimes we're looking in the wrong place. Sometimes we're not open to what the answer actually is. Sometimes you don't need to know that yet. Sometimes if you did know, you would not understand just as we found with our own children and some of the hard questions that they try to ask us with their limited understanding compared to ours. At the end of the day, for Job, the answer lay in none of these things, but in his own renewed experience of the God who had the answers. His own understanding of the power and love and mercy of God towards Job, in his difficulty, with his problem, still carrying on. And it was knowing the love and the mercy of God himself for him. A, a tremendous, in his case, dramatic kutch from the living God who loved him, that resolved all his hardest questions for him. And no answer in word, or rhyme, or riddle, or philosophy, actually did it for him at all just as with our children they'll accept from us sometimes no answer but our love and our care and renewed trust in us and sometimes that's the answer for us and our hardest questions of God too why don't you not take my word for it why don't you find yourself a Bible, get yourself just before the, the middle part of that book, into, into the book of Job. You'll find it just before the Psalms, which is about the middle of a whole Bible. Read that story. Have a think through the tough questions that his hard experience of life threw up for Job. And see how God, knowing God, put the whole deal into such a perspective that Job's life was renewed. Renewed. Completely changed. And if that seems like a long read, why don't you go to Read the Bible Project? Read the Bible Project. And you find it on the internet. And have a look there for the little animation they've done, a number of few minutes long, on the book of Job. And that'll just open that up to you, and it may help you if you have hard questions you'd like answers to, but you don't seem to be able to get them yet either. I hope it does. God bless you. <laughs>